This is chapter 31, head trauma. First, I wanted to remind you that the brain is the center of our consciousness. So anything that affects the brain, whether it's drugs or alcohol or fever, or in this case, trauma, can affect the person's level of consciousness. And that's one of the earliest signs that we're gonna be able to detect when someone has a brain injury from a fall or some type of trauma. Let's look at this scenario. So you're working on an ambulance, you're working at two EMTs, you get called to a local college dormitory for a 22 year old male. Uh, his roommate got up this morning to wake up the patient, couldn't wake him up. You arrive on scene with all your gear and the patient's lying in bed. They're unresponsive to painful stimuli. So you go through your primary assessment, he's breathing, he has a pulse, his skins are okay, but you just can't wake him up. Now, of course, you're gonna get a blood sugar on him, and because he's unresponsive, you are gonna do a head to toe assessment on them. Now, if you add up this situation initially, you got a 22 year old male living in a college dorm who now can't wake up. And probably your first thought is drugs or alcohol, which is, which is very much the possibility. But unless you do a complete assessment, you might miss that, that other thing that might be going on. And in this case, you do your head to toe rapid trauma assessment or just rapid assessment. And what you find is a big goose egg, a big bump on the back of his head. And in fact, the night before he did, he did get drunk and he was staggering home from a party. He tripped and fell, hit the back of his head. He got up, went home, back to his dorm, went back to bed and, uh, the during the night, the swelling and the bleeding from this brain injury is now caused to him to have an altered mental status. Now, treatment for this, it would be spinal motion restriction, monitor ABCs, and rapid transport to a trauma center. Now, when it comes to the signs and symptoms of, of a, a brain injury, um, a lot of times people will have obvious signs of trauma to their scalp. They can have lacerations, abrasions, um, and, and those, are, those are great, but not everyone with a serious life-threatening brain injury has obvious outward, outward signs of injury. So someone can bump their head and just in the right way and have internal bleeding and there's absolutely no signs on the outside. The other problem that we run into is, is hair, especially people with really thick hair. If they're bleeding, it's hard to really tell where the bleeding's coming from or how large the laceration is. I mean, if, if you look at the picture in the upper left side, that laceration to this person's forehead, uh, that's, that's pretty well exposed. But even as you see it there, there's no way you can tell whether that's that's involving the skull itself or that's just soft tissue from the, from the skin. So when you, you mix matted hair and blood and trying to find these lacerations, it's very difficult to determine the severity of their head injury. Again, the best way to determine it is if they have an altered mental status, they're more than likely having some type of brain related problem. Now, if they do fracture their skull, some of them are obvious. There's a big dent in their head. It's pretty rare, but it can happen. You might find a soft spot where the skull is fractured. Uh, for us, really, it doesn't really matter in, this, in that respect. Recognition and rapid transport is the most important thing here. Uh, I wouldn't start poking into the holes. Who knows what you might be poking into. Now, as you learned from your uh, um, anatomy and physiology portion of your class, the, the, the plate, the basilar plate that the brain kind of rests on when it's in, uh, in the cranial vault, uh, that can crack as well. And we talked about basilar skull fractures. This happens a lot with people who, who hit their head, the occipital side or the frontal portion of their head. Um, I had a gentleman years ago, he was walking home from a party, stone drunk, and he walked into a telephone pole, slammed his forehead into the, into the telephone pole, and then fell back, hitting the back of his head on, on the sidewalk. And this, this 
this process of this, this double blow uh, led to this person having a, a fractured basilar skull plate. And as you remember, the signs and symptoms, of course, they can have blood or cervical spinal fluid leaking from their nose uh, or their ears. They can have battle signs or raccoon eyes with this. Remember, battle signs and raccoon eyes, the, the, the discoloration under the eyes or the, the, the discoloration behind the ears is a very late sign. It takes a couple hours for that step to really start to manifest. But usually the spinal fluid uh, you'll see pretty soon after. But again, you know, they might also have this altered mental state, this confusion, disorientation. Uh, they might not remember what happened, that there's amnesia effect going on. Now, how this all works is there's there's really a, a primary brain injury and then there's secondary brain injury. So a primary brain injury would be being hit uh, inside of the head with a baseball bat. So the blow causes axonal injury or tearing, uh, or it causes uh, a shard of bone to penetrate into the brain. Whatever it might be, it's the brain tissue itself is damaged, it's bleeding, it's swelling. And because of this swelling and bleeding of the brain tissue, it, it decreases the perfusion to the brain, leading to hypoxia for not just that one small area of the brain that's injured, but eventually the entire brain becomes hypoxic. And so this is a secondary injury. So the primary injury is the, the actual mechanism that caused the initial problem. But now this swelling and the bleeding has led to a secondary injury, which is the hypoxia, which leads to tissue damage and death to the brain tissue. Now, the simplest form of a brain injury is called a concussion. We've probably all had concussions in our lives. You probably might not even have known it. I'm sure if you're any kind of football player or sports enthusiast of any type, you probably learned about CTE. And you know this happens from repeated concussions. And normally if you have a single concussion or maybe two concussions in your lifetime or however few it might be, there's no... Uh, actual mapping or modeling of the brain. So the brain doesn't change. There's no permanent damage to the brain. There's some type of blunt force trauma. There's no skull fracture sort of associated with this. There's no bleeding in any way. The tissue itself, the brain tissue, is not damaged in any way. It's, um, it's sort of stunned temporarily. And you might lose consciousness for a couple of seconds during the initial uh, impact. When you do wake up, you'll probably have no recall of what happened, and you might have also reduced ability to remember or memorize. For instance, uh, you can have anterograde or retrograde amnesia, which means essentially that uh, you don't really remember what happened. Like, you don't remember that you fell off your bicycle and hit your head, and then when I tell you something, you've forgotten it almost immediately. And this, this, you know, this obviously gets better over a period of, of hours or days. Associated with all this also is you can have uh, nausea, headache, dizziness, uh, a little bit of confusion as well. So, for instance, with a, with a concussion, you might uh, be working on the patient, maybe putting him in spinal motion restriction and taking him to the hospital, and he'll turn to you and go, hey, what happened? And you'll say, well, you fell off your bicycle today, sir. Oh, okay. And then literally three minutes later, he'll ask you, hey, what happened? Because he, he can't retain that memory just yet. Maybe in a few hours he can. Maybe what happened will come back in a few hours. But right now he has this, this anterograde and retrograde amnesia. Now, contusions, I'm sure we've all had a contusion. Basically, it's a bruise. And now with what a, what a bruise is essentially is very small blood vessels have been ruptured. So if you bang your thigh against the side of a building or something and your, your leg bruises, you've ruptured little tiny capillaries in the skin. Well, this is the same thing with the brain is you rupture these little tiny blood vessels in the brain leading to this 
area of bleeding. Now, this is a little more force involved. And because the brain, even though the brain is fairly tightly packed in the cranial vault, uh, it does have some movement associated with it. Uh, it has some, some give and take. And so when you hit your head, let's say, for instance, looking at this picture here, when the baseball bat strikes this person's forehead, the brain goes towards the impact. And once it goes towards the impact, the brain strikes the frontal lobe of the, uh, of the, of the vault. And then, because every, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, it actually goes the other direction. It goes to the, to the occipital side, and it bangs against the back of the, of the skull. So you have this, actually, two sides of the brain are being injured by this impact. And now you have... Now you have this bleeding and maybe even some swelling going on, which does lead to, to actually mapping or modeling of the brain, causing some, some permanent scarring of the brain. You'll, you could have all the signs and symptoms of, of a concussion, plus you're probably going to be unconscious for a longer period of time. So you might go, go unconscious for more than a couple of seconds, might be out for five minutes or so. You could have seizures associated with this. They'll vomit, and their pupils, because there is some swelling involved, depending on where the swelling is, you might get some unequal pupils. So the one pupil might be bigger than the other pupil, or vice versa. And this is because the swelling is pressing on the optic nerve, making those changes. This is a much more serious injury with, with permanent consequences to one degree or another. Now, other types of injuries, uh, subdural hematomas. Now, I, I talked about how the brain has some movement. Well, as you get older, as you age, in the aging process, your brain shrinks over time. Uh, people who are chronic alcoholics, over years and years and years of drinking alcohol, along with the aging process, their brain shrinks. So now it takes up less area of the cranial vault. So if they do fall into their head, the brain moves more freely within that, within that vault. And that coup contra coup process is much more exaggerated. And we have on the, uh, we have the, we have the, the, the meningeal layers. We have the, uh, the, uh, the dura mater and the pia mater and the, and the arachnoid space. So the dura mater is the outside layer. And between the outside layer and the brain, uh, we actually have these blood vessels. They're veins, essentially. So if, if you have a, have a person who has this brain shrinkage from the alcoholism or, and or aging process and they strike their head, uh, they can tear a blood vessel and it causes this venous bleed into this subdural space. So it's under the dura mater, basically. And because it's venous bleeding, it doesn't bleed very rapidly, usually. So, th so they might strike their head now, and then hours and hours, even days later, they become symptomatic because it took that long for enough blood to pool to cause the brain to malfunction. Now, this gets accelerated if they're on blood thinning medications like Plavix or Coumadin type of blood thinning medications. And this is why when we have people, especially elderly people who fall and hit their head, we're very concerned because they could have a subdural bleed and it'd be absolutely be completely asymptomatic when we get there. But unless they go to the hospital and get a CT scan, they're not going to be able to catch this early enough to help the person. So it's, it's, it's really a good idea to, to be highly, highly suspicious of, of any uh, old person who's hit their head. Uh, they really need to go to the hospital and get checked out, whether they're on blood thinners or not. Signs and symptoms mimic uh, a, a contusion. So you can get unequal pupils, altered mental status, seizures, uh, in early stages, they could have memory loss. They, they, they could forget what happened, possibly. Uh, they can have stroke-like symptoms because of the way this is working. They can have de neuro deficits from this uh, as well. And subdural hematomas, they come on slowly because it's venous bleeding. Now, 
The other one is an epidural. This means upon the dura mater, or above the dura mater. So these are arteries. And as we already know, arteries are three times the pressure of any kind of vein. So same kind of thing happens. Uh, this, this artery gets ruptured and blood just pours out into the cranial vault, putting pressure on the brain and herniating the brain, causing that secondary injury I talked about earlier. It causes pressure on the tissue, it reduces blood flow to the brain, the brain becomes hypoxic, starts to swell, and of course, it just goes downhill from there. Signs and symptoms, um, if, it's, if it's severe enough, what usually happens with these is they strike their head, they go unconscious immediately upon impact. Um, they might wake up a few minutes later for maybe a half a minute or so, and then they quickly go back unconscious again. So there's this period of call a lucid intervals. So they go unconscious from the initial primary injury. Three, four, or five minutes later, they wake up. They might talk to you and say their name. And then within a few seconds, they go back unconscious again. You can have unequal pupils. You can have seizures, posturing, uh, stroke-like symptoms. Uh, those are all the signs and symptoms of an epidural. Very fast onset because it's very high pressure and it causes a lot of damage really quickly. Now, Cushing's response. It would be a really good idea for you guys to uh, read up on this in your book and in your chapter. But what happens is, is let's say we have that, that internal bleeding and swelling going on inside the cranial vault due to some primary injury, like getting hit in the head. And because of the pressure from the head injury, and because of the hypoxia created by this, this, this pressure, the chemoreceptor, the central chemoreceptor, recognizes that the brain has low oxygen levels and it has high carbon dioxide levels because it can't really circulate blood. It can't get rid of that bad blood. So the, the chemoreceptor recognizes this, but it can't really tell exactly where it is. It, it doesn't know that it's in the brain. It just thinks the whole body is hypoxic. And what does the body do when it recognizes hypoxia? We kind of learned about this in the anatomy physiology lectures. So what it does is it causes vasoconstriction. It sends out messages to vasoconstrict, the alpha products. It increases cardiac output by in increasing the, the cardiac, how fast it beats and how, how strong it beats. So it increases the automaticity, the contractility, and all that. So now you have this vasoconstriction. If you add, if you add together vasoconstriction and increased cardiac output, you get a really high blood pressure. Well, the problem with all this is, is that this guy's blood pressure was probably normal in the first place. The only place in his body that he was hypoxic was his brain. But unfortunately, the chemoreceptor didn't know this. It couldn't tell. So now it just raised up this guy's blood pressure like way high. Um, using this vasoconstriction and increased cardiac output. So what happens is, is that, that was the central nervous system doing its job. The peripheral baroreceptor, remember baroreceptors measure, measure pressure, and in, in this case it's going to be blood pressure. It recognizes that this, this is really high systolic and diastolic pressure going on. And it, it knows that it needs to to slow it down or stop the process. So what it does is the baroreceptor stimulates the vagal response or the vagus nerve. And what the vagus nerve does, it does two things. When, when the vagus nerve is stimulated, it slows down your heart rate and it releases mediators that help to uh, cause vasodilation. So what you get out of this, if you think about it, let's say initially the central nervous system causes vasoconstriction and increased cardiac output. So now the, now the blood pressure is, uh, let's call it 200 over 100. It's really super, super high. Well, the, the 200 is the arterial pressure. That's the pressure that the, the heart is pumping out at. That's a, that's, a, that's a really high cardiac output. 
being pushed out into the into the arterial system. The vasoconstriction causes that diastolic number to be 100. Now, if you add in what happens with the baroreceptors and what happens in with the vagal response, the vagal response, what happens is, is the, the body tries to lower that pressure and it causes some vasodilation. So the upper number stays the same, 200, but the lower number starts to drop because of this vagal response and this, 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 uh, this vasodilation being trying to be performed by the, 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 the baroreceptors. So what this all leads to is two things. One, it leads to a widened pulse pressure. So now you have 200 over 70, a really high pulse pressure. And because the vagus nerve controls the sinoatrial node, the pacemaker of the heart, it causes the heart to slow down. It's still beating really hard, but it's slowing down, becoming bradycardic. So the, really the, 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 the telltale uh, triad, they call, this is called Cushing's triad or Cushing's reflex. The triad, there's, there's, there's three parts to this. First is they have a wide pulse pressure. So again, that's you know, 200 over 70. It's a really wide difference between those two numbers, the diastolic and the anastolic. They have a really slow heart rate and their breathing is irregular due to the fact that the brainstem now is involved and as we know the brainstem controls breathing that's where your that's where your, your breathing center is essentially so now the breathing is irregular it's ineffective uh, and it's it's not working out very well i guess So now you have this gentleman, 18-year-old male, riding his bicycle, struck by a car. Patient's on the ground. He's ANO times three. He has no recall of the event. He's nauseated and dizzy. So just based on that right now, uh, you can almost guess at the very minimum, he has probably a concussion. Now, what are you going to do? First thing, of course, is spinal motion restriction. Have someone hold this person's head and neck in place. Put a collar on them. You would have already checked their PMS. If they had, if it was bleeding anywhere of, of any significance, you would stop the bleeding. You get them off the street, get them on a spine board, and then onto a gurney, and then into the back of the ambulance. And then do your vital signs, get your history, do a complete head to toe, make sure their hips are okay and their legs are okay, and nothing's broken. Uh, oxygen saturation, all that great stuff as necessary. Sample history. And what you're going to notice, like I said, is you're going to notice they're going to have this anterograde and retrograde amnesia. They're not going to know, remember what happened because they have this, the brain's been stunned essentially. And they're not going to be able to remember things for, for, for very long. So again, they're going, to, they're going to keep asking you the same questions. It's called, it's called repetitive questioning and it's a sign of a, of a concussion. So treating this person... Uh, so we already talked about spinal motion restriction. If you think it's necessary, in that case, I would definitely consider it. Uh, ABCs, control bleeding. Now, when it comes to treating people with, with Cushing's, <clears throat> so Cushing's response, uh, if you encounter someone with a wide pulse pressure, with unequal pupils, with irregular breathing that's ineffective, uh, with a bradycardic rhythm, and uh, you consider this to be a potential uh, herniation of the brain due to this brain injury, we're going to treat this with bag valve mass ventilations. Now, according to National Registry, uh, they, would, they want us to hyperventilate this patient uh, 20 to 24 breaths per minute. And the, the idea behind that is, is uh, you are getting rid of the carbon dioxide and you're, you're uploading extra oxygen into the brain because the brain, remember the brain's hypoxic. So the theory behind this is, is you're, you're promoting more oxygen to get into the brain where it's needed. The problem with all this is, is, is you can recall back from your, uh, your uh, anatomy and physiology course, 
is oxygen is a vasoconstrictor. So if you hypersaturate someone with oxygen in their entire body, not just in their brain, you're actually reducing the amount of, of oxygen getting to the actually to the tissues in the, in the little tiny capillaries. Everything's going to be constricted. So the county of San Diego is different. The county of San Diego actually says that we're going to ventilate uh, six to eight breaths per minute. We're going to hypoventilate these patients. And what, what this does is it promotes the retention of carbon dioxide and it, it doesn't give them as much oxygen. So it promotes vasodilation. So it increases blood flow to the brain and helps with that hypoxia. So for any kind of test questions or, or quizzes, if it's National Registry, they want you to hyperventilate. And if it's County San Diego protocol, they want you to hypoventilate these patients. I know it's confusing, but that's just the way life is. I think we're done.